morning we're reading the story of the Transfiguration from the ninth chapter of Mark's Gospel. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have been blessed to make two trips to the nation of Japan, one in 1989, I think it was, and one in 1990. 1989, I went to visit a friend of mine from college who had been teaching there for four years before he moved back here with his new wife. And one of the things I really wanted to do when I was there was see Mount Fuji. We took a train to another volcano, and I don't even remember the name of that one, paid $245, and this is in 1989, so imagine how much that was then, to take a taxi up another volcano to hopes of seeing Mount Fuji. Because there are a lot of folks who've lived in Japan their entire lives who have never seen Mount Fuji, because it is often completely covered in clouds. And as we drove up, we drove up, we drove up, we kept going higher and higher and higher. My friend, who was very fluent in Japanese, was conversing with the taxi driver who said, not going to happen today. Tell her to give it up. But I prayed like the widow seeking justice. I kept praying and praying and praying, God, please let me just see it. Suddenly we popped through the clouds, and there it was. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life, this perfectly conical turquoise and azure mountain covered with snow. And I immediately burst forth in the psalm, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Not in today's lessons. It's very interesting. I went back a year later for the United Methodist Board of Global Ministries, took the train that I took to Mount Fuji or to the other volcano to go up Mount Fuji, stared out the window the whole time, and all you saw was a plain sky. It was completely hidden. We had to go very high to see even a mountain that was even higher, a volcano that was even higher. And it does change your perspective, doesn't it? Some people will ask, are you a beach person or a mountain person? I happen to be both. I like the calm of the ocean. It, nothing relaxes me more than to watch the surf and to look out and to watch the sunset over the, on the Atlantic or to see the sunset over the Pacific Ocean is one of the most relaxing things for me. But there are times that I need to go to the mountains. I really missed my trip to the Adirondacks this past year because of the COVID pandemic. Because there are places in the world that are called thin places in Celtic uh, spiritual practice where the Celts, both the pre-Christian Celts and the Christian Celts, believe that heaven was no more than three feet away, but there are some places that you go to where you're close enough to reach out and touch it. And for me, the Adirondacks is one of those places. I never feel closer to God than when I'm in the mountains of the Adirondacks. We're talking about mountaintop experiences today as we read the story of Jesus being transfigured before the disciples, Peter, James, and John in this case. He had just finished asking them, who are people saying that I am? And then who do you say that I am? And as soon as Peter says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God, Jesus says, now that you know who I am, let me tell you what's going to happen. And we set in motion his trip as he faces Jerusalem and his own death, especially in Mark's gospel, very short, very to the point. And who do they see when they get up there but Moses and Elijah, both of whom had had their own mountaintop experiences. Moses went up the mountain to receive those commandments, and when he came back, his face was changed, and so he wore a veil for the rest of his days. Maybe you're not as familiar with the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah had his mountaintop experience when he was in the presence of God because he was hiding from Queen Jezebel who had threatened to take his life after God had let him triumph over the priests of Baal. You remember the story of the 
offering, the burnt offering, and they poured water all over Elijah's, and because God was with him, he called the fire from heaven, and it lighted, and the priests of Baal could not do the same. But then when Jezebel threatens to kill him, he runs and he hides, and he hides in a cave, and God calls him from the mouth of the cave, and God has him on the mountain in his presence, and he sees all those things happen, the fire and the whirlwind, and God was not there. God was in the still, small voice that spoke to him and spoke to him about God's redemption and God's redeeming love. And then Elijah kind of let off the hook because who follows him but Elisha? We read the story today where Elisha wants to hold on to his master, but the mantle passes literally from Elijah to Elisha, and he is swept away. If the hymn came to your mind, I hope you sing it out loud. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Elijah was swept up in the chariot into the heavens, which is why this Passover, like every other Passover, when Jewish families sit down to the Seder meal, there is a seat that is left empty for Elijah, for his return is a sign of the Messiah coming, which is exactly what is happening on this mountain today. Jesus and his disciples are there, and suddenly he is transfigured before them. They see the light that has come into the world in him very clearly. He seems to be glowing. His clothing becomes white, whiter than any bleach could ever accomplish, and he is radiating the light of God. Now, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to make of this. They're terrified. And Peter, as he always does, just sort of blunders through and says, let me build some tents. Let me put some dwellings here, because he wants to stay on that mountaintop with Elijah and Moses and Jesus. Now, you notice the word is transfiguration and not transformation because Jesus was not transformed. What changed for those disciples was the view from the mountain allowed them to see who he really was. The transfiguration story is the end of the season after the Christmas season, after the day of Epiphany. And we spent all of those Sundays in between Epiphany and Transfiguration and Lent, talking about the light of God coming into the world in Jesus Christ, the light that no darkness could overcome. So we have bookended this season with the star that led those wise men, those travelers from the east, to find the baby Jesus, to the light that is Jesus Christ. And what has to change for us to be able to see it is not Jesus. Jesus never changed. Jesus has always been the light of the world. What changed was their ability to perceive who he was by understanding why he had come. He tried to tell them, and Peter didn't want to hear it, that he had to go forth and he had to die so that he might be raised again. Because that is why he came, to redeem humankind. Now, if you've ever had a mountaintop experience, if you've ever been up there and you've seen things more clearly, whether it's Mount Fuji in the distance or just to feel closer to God when you're there surrounded by the air. And I know when I've gone to southern West Virginia, when I lived there, there is a place that I go, and it's a place where my husband is buried, but we would drive up to see his parents' grave. And I remember looking over the edge, which was unfortunately very close to the road, seeing eagles flying beneath us. Because when you're high enough, you get to see things differently, things that you don't see. And going up the mountain to be with Christ, they got to see who he really was. But you can't stay on a mountaintop experience. You have to go back into the valley. Now for Elijah, his time of service had ended and Elisha took up the mantle for the disciples who would go down into the valley. And what did Jesus say as they were leaving? Because what does this passage end with? But until his death and his resurrection, they have to be quiet about what they've seen. They can't tell anyone yet. Mark's gospel is full of the shh, wait, not yet, until the time of his Resurrection would reveal fully who he was. And the disciples would know once and for all that everything that they had seen and heard was absolutely true. He would even call them from their place of hiding, and they would accept the mantle of discipleship in a new way. They wouldn't be following Jesus anymore. They would be embodying Jesus for the world. They would carry him to the far ends of the world. They would carry him to Cockeysville, Maryland, which is why we're here today, because that mantle has passed from disciple to disciple, from prophet to prophet through the years. So here we are. Are we on the mountain or coming down? I don't know right now. We don't know if we're coming or going right now, do we, with the COVID pandemic? We don't know what's coming next. We hope it's spring, but 
it's snowing and sleeting and it's called for for day after day after day. We're looking for signs of spring. We're looking for signs of hope. We're looking for signs of peace among those who are in our government at odds right now. But there's an interesting thing. If you think about the shape of a mountain, especially a mountain like Mount Fuji, very much a conical mountain, which is almost a triangle. Think about a triangle being the mountain and God being at the top. What happens whether you're on the right or on the left or you find yourself right in the middle? The closer you get to God, the closer you get to each other. The closer we all get to God, the closer we become to each other. That's what I'm hoping that the view from up here might teach us, that when we're in the presence of God, that God becomes unveiled for us just as God was unveiled in the words of the Apostle Paul that we read in the Epistle lesson this morning. And just as on the Transfiguration, it's not Jesus who has changed. It is our ability to see him as who he is. If we see Christ for who he is, we will see each other very differently. We will see the world differently. Not looking down the mountain at them, but going down the mountain to be with them and among them, to bring hope and healing, to bring words of comfort and peace and security, to teach each other the gospel, the good news of Christ Jesus our Savior, who came that we might know life abundantly, who died for our sake to forgive our sins and who rose to make us new. So I wish you this Lent as we enter into it, a holy time of growing closer to God and closer to one another. And I hope that you can remember those times that you've been at the top of a mountain. And if you're not there right now, if you feel like you're down in the valley, way down in the valley, call someone from the congregation, call me, call a friend, pray together so that you might know the peace that Christ brings and the hope that is ours in Jesus our Lord. Because he came to bring the light into the world and that light has never been overcome. Praise be to God, it never will. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.